Good evening, everyone, and welcome to February, Valentine's Day, Love Month, and all the fun things that makes romance romantic, I guess. But that would be under John C. Luna. He's the romantic. I'm the skeptic when it comes to love. Well, it depends. Sometimes you lo- you do like the woo-woo, and I'm the skeptic on that one. Well, that's true. You are the one who meditates more and tells me I need to meditate more. Yes, you do. But then again, I hit the science and my heart rate's nice and low at around 65. And yours hovers at about 101 when you're just nice and calm. So, but it's funny. No, that's a really good segue because we're going to be talking actual science on this one. Science. I know. And it's not sci-fi this time. No, it's, it, it's real science. Yes, we do do that real science thing. So we have a guest on the show. Her name is Dr. David. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Star Wars jump here. Dr. Nicole Prousey, PhD and a sexual psychotherapist. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me on. Sounds like fun already. Can't wait. The jokes will just keep on rolling. But <laughs> so- no, I'm uh, going through your bio. Impressed is not the word on so many levels neuroscientist, uh, data scientist, specializing in addictions. I saw Harvard on there. Statistics. I'm like, oh God, this is way beyond my pay grade. And got to work (laughs) for the World Health Organization. I'm already a fan. (laughs) Yeah, I loved, I got uh, just the first time last summer. um, Well, I guess it's actually January. I was out uh, actually in Africa working on a sexual health um, item, like trying to develop a survey that actually captured not only the negatives around sexuality, but also some of the positives, you know, which we often forget to even ask about. Uh, And that measure of, uh, that's hopefully going to be used internationally, just came out in a publication like two weeks ago also uh, from that time with the WHO. So I'm excited this stuff is all kind of coming to fruition at once, but I loved working over there because it really pushes you to think, you know, what kind of stuff are we concerned about here? Like, is this really you know, what what's reasonable to be worried about? And how much do they care about orgasms in Malaysia? And uh, it's a cool perspective. It's always interesting to see because it's, it's very cultural. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, 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 the practice of how women are treated and sex is treated. And from country to country and, and culture to culture, it can be it can be so different. Um, and it's also a power struggle in in a lot of places. That's what struck me is there was a lot of focus while I was there on not only motherhood, but whether or not you have the choice of motherhood. And I was like, whoa, how many places are worried about this? You know, and like, you know, it's a concern in some places, but the way that it was being discussed, it kind of drove home like, we are privileged you know, to have concerns about orgasm gap and uh, you know some of the things that we write and think about in the US. Um, I think other places, it's not on the radar because they've got way bigger fish to fry, you know, kind of getting the right to even choose if they want to be pregnant or not. And um, it helps keep things in perspective with the kind of things that we study and worry about sometimes for sure. Now, when you say a choice to be pregnant or not, it, it was almost, I'm just, it, was it almost seen as like their duty to procreate? Uh, that seemed in some countries where they have really limited access to birth control or, you know, the uh, religious doctrine, um, limited access uh, either to birth control or to condom access. So the ability to protect oneself either from pregnancy or uh, sexually transmitted infections uh, the nature of like when you're allowed to wed, uh, who has dominion over that. And you just start realizing like, this is, you know, a much uh, different level of problem, even though like I knew that they existed. I, you know, I read about that in our journals, but just in English journals, we miss a lot of those concerns, you know, that uh, trouble a lot of the world. You know, we just don't have those kind of, um, we have those problems in North America, but at a much different scale in some places you're dealing with. So uh, I really appreciated that for just helping ground, you know, it's already be a, it sounds like a bit of a downer to start off with, but you know, it's also like how lucky are we that most of those things, you know, we have uh, at least most folks have some access to healthcare that is reasonable. They are supposed to give us access to birth control. They're supposed to, you know, um, so we have a lot of advantages 
here, you know, and access to things that aren't assumed other places. And I'm grateful for that. Couldn't agree with you more. The U.S., we we don't realize what we have here. Oh, come on. We're overprivileged and overindulge and, you know, a lot of other countries. See, because I grew up going to Mexico for 15 years every holiday. So that was our vacation time. So I got to see how other countries really see us, like Mexico to the United States. Even though we're connected, they always often called me out as spoiled little princess. You're so privileged. You don't know what you have. And I'm like, whoa, 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 excuse me. I, I live in a different country, but I did acknowledge the different lifestyles and what privileges I do have versus what they have, especially when it came to poverty, medical access. Um, my grandparents, even in the 1980s, going into the 90s, lived up in the mountain, no electricity, no running water. I thought I was stuck in 1900. I was like, I need a toilet. My cousin pointed to a cactus plant. They're like, there you go. I'm like, no, 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 no. I need running right. water. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So I understand from that perspective that we don't see those challenges of like, hey, you have to marry this person. No, you can't have children or, you, you know, different mm -hmm. things, different countries. So. And I'll say just just because we're spoiled, I know a lot of stuff we talk about on our show is, is sex related, has a lot to do with um, not just the pleasure and the exploration of it, but the rights as well. And although we are, I feel privileged to be able to talk about that, um, it still means it's something we should talk about because the for a privileged country, we are on the for, forefront and a lot of countries look to us for progress. I think not only that, but I would take a step further. So I think in our field uh, that is sexual physiology, we're often arguing for the importance of sex where we're trying to say, oh, you know, we should have funding to study the nature of pleasure. And I think we should be taking it further than that and say we can use sexual stimulation to improve general health conditions. And if we limit ourselves and say, you know, I'm just going to study orgasm for orgasm's sake. Nothing wrong with that. You know, you should get pleasure where you can. But um, <laughs> but orgasm also has some really unique uh, physiological features that help promote sleep, for example. You know, could we reduce the use of sleep aids in the U.S. if we had a way of systematically using orgasm in humans um, so that we weren't so chicken about having that conversation with our patients and saying, like, have you tried <laughs> you know, um, using this in a systematic way, you know, about an hour before you go to sleep, maybe 30 minutes. Uh, and we don't have those data in humans. It's crazy that we don't. So, you know, those kind of things, it's uh, failing to discuss sex is not only lacking, you know, some discussion of pleasure and those uh, kinds of uh, nice issues, nice to haves, uh, but it also cuts us off of access to potential health care. So, you know, is uh, being in a sexually aroused state meditative in some way? Could it have similar benefits uh, to general forms of meditation? Uh, is just being sexually aroused enough to connect us to another person and reduce our feelings of loneliness, uh, promote connection when we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, trying to figure out how to be in this space that feels sometimes very isolated. Uh, who's in our bubble? You know, what can we do with who's here? Well, well, I know they have a lot of science showing that meditation does help, but you have orgasmic meditation. Explain yes. how this helps. <laughs> so I had never heard of this either when it first came across my, uh, my desk from a colleague. And orgasmic meditation um, is a bit of a misname because they generally don't experience a physical climax from the practice. And it's not meant to be meditative in the sense they're not like teaching breathing or trying to invoke a particular uh, state uh, that looks meditative. So this practice at its core involves 15 minutes of manual genital stimulation. That is uh, a partner, which can be any gender, is stimulating the just outside and above the clitoris of someone who has a vulva for 15 minutes with the only goal to experience sensation. And that's the core of the practice. Now they built up a number of uh, things around that that we also use in our research uh, to make that experience something that's safe and predictable. And of course, when we take things into the laboratory with couples, this is essential. You know, we have to have a practice where we feel confident, our research participants feel safe, declining if they should feel the need, expressing, you know, I change this, do it faster, slower, pause, <laughs> you know, whatever they need. And so we saw orgasmic meditation in part as interesting practice, amazing for the laboratory. 
You know, like how we couldn't have designed if we wanted to study uh, sex in the lab, the challenges, you know, I can't, I have to have something that's systematic. I can't just open my lab door and say like, all right, kids have fun. You know, <laughs> like we would have no idea what they were doing. You know, are they going to have oral sex or not? Are they going to do that for two minutes or 10 minutes? Um, and it's really hard to say, you know, what is this interaction we want them to have? And so orgasmic meditation also provided this really nice, like established procedure for kind of walking through a partner genital stimulation that allows us to study that in a systematic way in the lab. So you're taking a scientific approach to it that we have a standard way that all couples will perform said action. Yes. So they, they already had it laid out for us and we're like, awesome. <laughs> so follow the directions. <laughs> and what were the observed results off of that? <laughs> Uh, so we've conducted a series of studies and we're most excited because we just had a paper accepted in PLOS One that is the first one on these data and peer review. And so that study, we had 125 couples, that's 250 people that came into the laboratory and as a part of that study, um, engaged in orgasmic meditation in a separate private room. <laughs> so we were on the other side of a door uh, monitoring their physiology and uh, we also asked them to report just before they engaged in the practice, how they felt. So a number of different kinds of emotional reports and how close they felt to that person. And then afterwards, again, you know, how did you feel? Uh, all the different emotions and how close they felt to that person. And this particular study, we really focused on closeness and uh, we had gotten uh, lucky maybe in the sense that when we designed the study, we said, you know, if you don't have a romantic partner, you can bring in whomever you want to do this practice with, as long as you've done it with them once before so that you feel reasonably comfortable with them. And just by chance, uh, we found about half of our sample came with someone who was not their romantic partner. And we said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> we should definitely see what the difference in effects might be. Because you know, there's this kind of stereotype that if you don't have an established romantic relationship with someone, you you can't connect with them. You know, you're not going to have an experience that is fulfilling in that way. That's reserved. That's only for romantic couples. And so uh, we did find a main effect, unsurprisingly, that uh, in orgasmic meditation, in general, across all the people, they experience more closeness after engaging in orgasmic meditation. <laughs> That's maybe not surprising. What was surprising is that the people who were not there with their romantic partner had a larger increase in experience of closeness with that person. And that we did not expect. <laughs> so um, what that suggests is that you don't need to have an established romantic relationship to have this potential benefit from practicing orgasmic meditation. Now, whether or not that generalizes to other sex practices, we don't know. Obviously, orgasmic meditation is not the same thing as sex, um, but we needed to start somewhere. So now balls in the court of another scientist, another lab to go and figure that next question out. Let someone else go ahead and prove or disprove the theories on there. But that's fantastic. I'm glad there's, there's more um, hardcore and uh, accountable science being done because there are so many misnomers about there about sex attraction how relationships work we're told often that uh this is how things should work mm -hmm. and whenever someone uses the word should i i stopped using the word should about 12 years ago because what i realized that what it meant was this is how i want things to be if i rule the world <laughs> yes it's the same thing. My, I think my, I'm also a licensed psychologist and I see patients and I think they know now, like if they do should, I'm like, no, I know. You know it's like the should word. It's a, a red flag almost always. So I got to ask what, how did this research get funded? Did you yeah, so we were funded by a nonprofit foundation in California that uh, was interested in seeing work done on it. So we, uh, it was structured as an investigator or uh, an investigator initiated grant or an IIR. And so what that means is, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Greg Siegel at University of Pittsburgh, and I uh, said, "Hey guys, your thing looks kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, we wondered if." You know, if we did some research on it, you know, we kind of want to look at this. Would you be willing to give us money if we did it in this way? And then importantly, uh, we own the data. So what that means is if we found negative effects, 
like closeness decreased. It makes people angry. We publish it regardless. So the funder has no say over what we publish. And that's an important part of scientific kind of integrity and independence. So uh, we are funded by that California nonprofit and then published as an investigator initiated research grant. Wow, that's interesting. Never thought of that. I I actually never heard uh, 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 of such a, a, a quantified, quantified, quantified. Yeah. <laughs> Tongue to a search, quantify. That's what I get for eating taffy earlier today, that caramel. Um, a quantified scientific research on sex. Of course, we've all heard of Kinsey, and he, he did a lot of progress in that, but there's still a lot more that needs to get done. Absolutely. And so one of our uh, progenitors, I actually think is Masters and Johnson. So they're some of the early people to put sensors on bodies uh, or uh, you know, at least hands on to try and monitor physiology. And, uh, you know, it turns out since then, there are some like underground labs, even I didn't know about when I was in grad school that I have since found out were uh, kind of operating or scientists were trying to learn about the physiology, but everyone was scared about their jobs. You know, they say, if you study this stuff, I mean, if you uh, watch the Masters of Sex series, you might have some idea of just how hard it is to do the work. And um, so to this day, you know, some of those scandals follow uh, us around. So I happen to train at the Kinsey Institute and um, there has always been this conspiracy theory about Kinsey that now follows me around. You know, people are saying I'm involved in some weird Nazi child molestation. Seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Program. Um, I was floored when I saw that. I was like, you, what? (laughs) But it's all over the web, you know, there are people just smearing you uh, due to this association with uh, sexuality they hate. And so it becomes anything that touches that, you know, that they feel uh, offends their um, insistence that you have sex like they want you to, uh, makes you a target. And uh, Kinsey is absolutely a kind of firebrand for that. And so a lot of us that train there uh, will continue, you know, I'm many years, I graduated in 2007, this stuff still follows you. People still lie about like what happened there. Um, You know, one of the things I uh, like is I was an employee there as a research coordinator for a while in the physiology lab. And people say, oh, you know, that lab, uh, they tested children there. I was like, I was literally in charge of that lab. (laughs) I was there every day. There were no children in the lab. (laughs) Like I know for a fact that never happened. Um, but it still follows me around, you know, and they make these wild claims and the potential of course, is that they can become dangerous. So if you see like the, remember the pizza gate controversy, uh, there was this idea that there was a pizza shop that was secretly, uh, sex trafficking kids. Uh, I think it was in the basement or something. And you think what a wild, crazy story. And then some dude shows up with a weapon and starts firing, you know, (laughs) and so he's arrested, you know, no one was hurt. Uh, but you have to be concerned about those things because you know someone that doesn't have their act together uh, to be generous uh, sees these conspiracies and could believe them, you know, and can uh, actually cause more threat than just these wild conspiracies that get floated around the internet. Yeah, it was interesting reading your article. There are five tips to survive a frivolous complaint against your psychologist license. And when I was reading it, I'm like. Oh my God, these guys are worse nut jobs than the other conspiracy theorists that I've seen. But it's such a headache. I, I'm so sorry you went through that for so many years. I know, I appreciate it, but it's also like, it's a very strange experience. So that, like, the licensure complaint was a group of certified sex addiction therapists who tried to, you know, they didn't like my research as far as I could tell. And so they filed this false complaint with my licensure. It resulted in a three-year investigation and I was cleared of everything, but I couldn't practice during that time. Like I wasn't able to see patients. It was crazy. And there's no, they have no business doing that. You know, it's clearly frivolous. Um, And yet, you know, this thing just seems they're, they'll try anything. You know, they contact my employers, they contact my grant agencies. Um, Every interview, you can plan on having some comments probably literally forward to it. Yeah, every interview I give, um, they say, do you know she molests children? Do you know? I was like, and they don't get tired. They never get tired. That's what obsessive conspiracy theorists do. After the last four years, I can believe people will believe anything. <laughs> um, and we don't, we don't, <laughs> try, to, we don't try to get political on <laughs> that. But um, we do live in a country where 
obviously privileged. We have social media and I love social media, but we're seeing the, the bad part of it where it does spread bullshit, pseudoscience, conspiracy theories like wildfire. I mean, one person makes it and it's all over the country in a moment. As legit, according to the pillow guy. And as it keeps going on now, like I said, we're getting not just not just the the, the I hate the nut job living in a you know off on a farm somewhere on his own. We're getting it was actually a what is it representative? The last one who talked about the the Jewish space laser. Oh yes, yeah. the Georgia representative, brand new House of Representative, believing and telling everyone that this is legit. This Jewish space laser shot oh, into yes. California and started the fires. That is exactly the anti-porn extremists are the same way. Like some of the stuff that comes out of their media, you're just like, you do not have all your marbles <laughs> to be generous. Uh, the challenge, of course, is uh, you wish that it would stay in their circles, you know, or that it would remain that small. But I know five women now who study the effects of pornography, you know, where either PhD granted or near it, um, who've had law enforcement present at their universities. We've had people actually show up where we work. Um, in one case, they were taking videos and posting them over a workplace. Um, I, I don't want to get too dark in this, but uh, about a, a year ago, a little more in October 2019, I was sexually assaulted outside of my office. And these people, are they don't stop. And they don't stop at things that are illegal or illegal. They don't care. Uh, it's anything to shut you up. And I think it's remarkable that it was five uh, PhD women who experienced this. You know, the guys don't seem to get the same kind of attention. And I think there's a reason for that. You know, I think these folks are targeting women uh, and that a lot of the kind of language that they use and the attacks are meant to intimidate and threaten women. So uh, like I said, I don't want (laughs) to, obviously there's a whole other issue around here and I have law enforcement uh, that are investigating as best they're able, uh, the threats and the things that have happened. And these women are all over the world, you know, so there's one in Canada, one in Germany, um, one in Ireland, and they just uh, disseminate these threats everywhere. And it's largely hate that's exported from the U.S. So it's really become a huge problem. And I think some of it is criminal. And I'm really concerned about, you know, it's it's already resulted in some criminal behavior. And so how, how bad, bad is it going to get? Where is it going to go? You know, it's hard to say because they seem to have no end. So... Uh, when I what I want to inf- <laughs> uh, kind of follow this up is there's also great reason for hope <laughs> because yeah. they've already done this. You know, they've made it. So what else do we have to lose at this point? You know, you've you've done everything you can to us. Um, we're still here. We're still studying. And I just published another paper. So good luck shutting us up. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, you're either going to get arrested or you're going to get tired of things. People are going to see what you're doing. So, uh, that's the hope is eventually, uh, I know that there's media interest in what's been happening and that there are some stories forthcoming. So I'm excited to see some of that stuff exposed and hopefully we'll be able to do our research in peace in the future. Well, first I want to say thank you for having the bravery to continue with this because it's, it's needed. And a little story I'll say, this ju- just happened. Um, of course, we get trolls on social media. All the time. And the argument started because we had reposted something about the incorrectness of a vulva as opposed to a penis in textbooks. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, little story about the clit's not even there, it's not mentioned. And got someone arguing about it and who all of a sudden started going into us being a feminist, this, that, and another. And mm-hmm. went through the entire thing. And I'm reading this. I'm going, he doesn't know he's talking to a man. No, he doesn't. Because the majority of the time I'm on there. No, I blocked the sorry ass. I was just like, I was so pissed. Of the oh, stupid, you did block him. Yes, I blocked him. I did not want to continue with the stupid argument of... It's wrong in the science book. We're just pointing it out. There is no other reason and functionality because it doesn't pee. It doesn't give birth. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just the scientific anatomy. And I'm just so sick and tired of people arguing science. It's legit. Well, I think that's the interesting thing. So I remember being confused when a lot of this started because um, people would say, oh, you know, look at so-and-so's research, look at so-and-so's research. And I was like, but they're, 
but they're not a scientist. Like, what, what are they talking about? Like, I thought maybe I wasn't finding something. Um, and eventually came to understand that among conspiracy theorists that, that research is Google, you know, that they Google things. <laughs> they say that's research. And of course, I don't consider that research. That's Googling. It's different. <laughs> you know, that peer-reviewed science uh, holds a different standard. And of course, these guys don't publish any peer-reviewed science. So um, not that peer review is the standard of everything. It can have its own uh, faults and challenges, certainly. But um, it's the, you know, the kind of taking of language, you know, trying to present yourself as something you're not or having credentials you don't have um, to try and claim science as your own. Say, no, we are on the side of science. Well, then go get a degree. You know, go publish your peer review if you're so concerned about it. But if you don't, you know, don't tell me you're doing research. <laughs> so it's, I am very sympathetic to that um, idea of, you know, well, I just don't like the science. And so it seems like the next iteration is to say, well, in fact, I invented the science. It's like, <laughs> okay, I'm not sure uh, why you think, uh, you know, not having any background is, uh, you know, gives you enough uh, understanding of what you're reading, you know, to really process those things. Again, not that some people can't have a reasonable understanding, you know, without going all the way through school. I think there are certainly uh, ways you can develop that understanding, and I would encourage it. Absolutely. You know, learn and learn about science. I read about things I don't understand all the time in science. That's part of the fun, you know, is how close can I get in physics? <laughs> you know, it's not, not my strength. Um, I had to learn for a vibrator study a while back. We put these piezoelectric accelerometers on commercial vibrators to try and characterize um, uh, their uh, vibratory characteristics. So this is frequency uh, displacement and acceleration. And so all of a sudden I'm like, you know, my high school <laughs> physics, I was like, I have forgotten all of these things. <laughs> you know, like, They're in here somewhere. Um, but it's trying to figure out like, again, how do I analyze these data? How do I, and there's such cool projects, you know, when you dip in and say, I'm going to do this as objectively as I possibly can, you know, how would you study a commercial vibrator if you wanted to, you know, come at it from as objective a standpoint as you could, what, what's important in those to understand? Uh, what do you want to know? What could that mean for research or for uh, consumers if you knew more about what the characteristics of those vibrators were? So uh, I love the scientific enterprise in general. I'm probably way too uh, thinly spread <laughs> for the kinds of things that I do, but it's also a lot of fun. Well, it's funny, uh, funny you mentioned that because we get to work with and talk with a lot of toy manufacturers. Oh, and yeah. We'll have some that are like more of the fluffy words of how nice it feels or how powerful it is. And then just every so often, I will get the ele the electrical or mechanical engineer. On oh, the yeah. Oh, my God. I can't. I was just... And they... We they had started one shop and I'm just like, I'm lost. You just lost me on that. You and John talk. So. Well, I understand that, you know, this has three motors and this one's here and this one's more powerful and I can see the angles. Then they start going into the, the megahertz and the, the, the frequencies RPMs. of the vibration. And you want your clitoris under any torque. That's what you need to. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was. really something you wanted. One of them, I remember they said it, it had like 7,000 RPMs at full blast. And my response was, I know that would blow my car engine. I have no idea what would it do, do to a Volvo. But <laughs> obviously people are buying it. But it was so interesting to hear. And it's fun when you get someone on a subject like that because their eyes light up with passion. It doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. It's you're interested in this in their little niche of science where they know their yes. stuff. Well, it's, there's something to seeing, I think, people's passions in general, too. Like, I've taken this weird series, I was a little afar, but, like, I've taken all these weird classes. I took a whole series of cake decorating classes. I took a skateboard class. I took motorcycle racing. Like, part of it is just seeing people in their passion. You know, it's like, what are you, uh, what do you really care about that you've gone so deep into? And none of these people are doing this professionally. They just love it you know? And so it's, uh, I think maybe that's part of it is just, it's their profession slash passion and seeing how far can I take this? You know, what can my knowledge do to improve sex tech or, uh, you know, to move us along in innovating sex tech? Um, so I'm always curious, like I've never talked to the guy who made the womanizer, um, which is now permuted a thousand times in different devices. 
but whose idea was it to do clitoral suction? I was like, and why didn't we do it before? And why that way? You know, <laughs> like, like that seemed like a real innovation after we had, you know, decades of just permutations of vibratory devices. I was like, this is truly different and interesting. Um, you know, as a, a sex technology development. And now there are a couple of studies on that suction device as compared to vibrators and finding that it seems to uh, maintain gains in orgasmic capacity over time uh, for women. So super cool stuff. Um, and I'm so glad they did it, you know, really looked into something that was unique and different uh, a mechanism for kind of accessing pleasure. Well, it's funny because on the way, I haven't gotten it yet, um... I heard about it last night uh, from a from a develop sex toy developer. They yeah. now have a men's stroker that involves uh, multiple air pressure. No air pressure. Oh, air pressure. Oh, that's an air pressure. Oh, you so didn't tell. Air, massaging through air pressure. So, okay. I, the first thing okay. I thought thought is like you know you you, you get the uh, the what is it thing you fill your tire yeah, up with when you first <laughs> blow it and you get all that pressure <laughs> on you and I'm like okay it won't be that high but yeah I'll try it out. But one of the interesting things, um, be, being you are a scientist, um, none of, well, I won't say none of, a lot of the things people say is, oh, well, there's no clinical study on it. Clinical studies are very expensive, aren't they? Yes. So I get this a lot with like, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that are involved in Tantra and they say, oh, you should study us. Should, I said, I would love to. Do you have any money? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Not that I'm not interested. It's just doing the type of research we do where people actually have to come in. We have to manage biohazard. We have to do informed consent that involves oversight from health and human services that we have to you know, go through those regulatory boards. Um, it's keeping people safe, you know, making sure people are well informed before they participate in our stuff. Um, it just requires a lot more structure uh, that becomes rapidly expensive. So uh, there's so many things that I wish I could study. And that was partly why we are so excited to have that um, grant for the orgasmic meditation study is what an opportunity, you know, to really look at a potential health application of something that was an intimate form of stimulation. I don't know when else I might have been able to do that kind of work. Cause you know, no one, I would say like, no one's going to fund that work, you know, are the sleep pill people going to help you see if orgasm could replace their pills? Of course not. You know, that's against all of their <laughs> marketing model. Um, Every so, drug company is going, no, 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 no yeah. Ambien, no melatonin. You can go to sleep on your own. Why would they want it? Yeah. And so I think there are some market forces that are uh, not conspiratorially at all. This is just very straightforward. You know, why would you fund this? Uh, so it's the groups that, you know, have some of this, you know, I've partnered with a couple of, um, for-profit companies over time just to do very targeted studies. Um, one was a vibrator, you know, where we did this. And so these can be really good partnerships where like in the vibrator study, I actually, uh, used that opportunity while I was testing their device, you know, and kind of accomplishing what they needed, uh, for their own, uh, research and development, I also included the anal device that we were developing to measure orgasm contractions uh, so that we had a comparable device in men and women. That's uh, why we measure from the anus in part. And so the development that I was able to do around that device, just as a function of doing this other work, allowed us to then get funding uh, to do a separate study from uh, the NORD, which is the National Organization of Rare Diseases. So now, you know, that whenever COVID stops, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you know, we will return to this. And now I'm using that anal device uh, in a study of men who have post-orgasmic illness syndrome. And so, you know, being able to partner with industry in a very targeted way can also promote science very directly in this case. You know, I mean, that was, that was how I tested that device was, you know, there was this very limited kind of for-profit um, that rolled into something that I was able to fun with uh, Dr. Tierney Lorenz from University, University of Nebraska um, to work on this other project. And so you really look for those opportunities. You know, there's not a lot of funding for sexuality. Uh, if you want to look to the federal government, that's National Institutes of Health or National Science Foundation in the U.S. Good luck if you're studying anything related to sex that's not bad. You can study HIV, you can study disease, uh, you can study suicidality and LGBT youth. But if you want to study something positive, 
Probably not federal. You don't. Not here. <laughs> now, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much, but you just mentioned something I had never heard of before. Post-orgasm illness? Yeah. <laughs> So this is why it's funded through the National Organization of Rare Diseases. <laughs> so it's thought to be fairly rare. It's thought to primarily occur in men, although there's some question if it might affect women also. And it's uh, folks who every time they orgasm, whether with a partner or by themselves, they experience two to seven days of flu-like symptoms. Oh, dear God. Yeah. That's the worst horrible thing I've ever heard of. No, I thought awful. giggling was bad. <laughs> So uh, Dr. Marcel Waldinger had been doing some research in this area, and he recently passed away where they were developing this kind of allergen model. And uh, we think that allergen model is probably not getting exactly what the problem is uh, for these guys. So uh, that's what our study is proposing to do is to kind of test an alternative model of what might be affected in these guys who have post-orgasmic illness syndrome. Um, I would hope to have been done by with data collection by now, but COVID. So we learned something new today. <laughs> We're learning a lot of new stuff today. I know, but that was like, hey. oh, I did not know that. And here I thought the Comedy Central calling her Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson of pussies was like something, whoa, that, that just, wow. sorry. <laughs> I, yeah. I get a lot of shiny, so. <laughs> uh, very cool. So we've talked about orgasmic meditation. We've talked about uh, sur sur well, the five tips for surviving a bit. Um, I don't know. What else do you think people need to know about the science of sex? Because I got to say, for all the people we've interviewed in the last five years, you're probably the, 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 the expert scientific on that as far as the health benefits of sex, the proven ones. <laughs> um. So I have a pet theory that I can wildly speculate about. Oh, I'm Ooh, dying I love, Yeah, yeah, there you go. We, we, we like these theories. <laughs> so we, we, bro we broadcast everything as we're teaching from our experiences. And if you really have questions, talk to your doctor. So we can say whatever the hell we want. We're not telling anyone to do anything. Because mm -mm, yeah. we don't want to send you to this ER. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of so many case reports I've read right now. But <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> what I'm... Uh, really interested in overturning, this is like my uh, secret, not secret uh, mission, is you, if you've taken a human sex class in college, you probably learned about the sexual response cycle, and you probably learned Masters and Johnson's uh, sexual response model. And they basically propose that uh, the sexual response is comprised of an excitement phase, um, a plateau phase, an orgasm, and a resolution. And I think they're missing a phase. So some of the data that we have from our orgasm studies suggest that excitement, okay, basically on board with that. Uh, but I think what they're calling plateau, they were imagining as a state that persists until magic happens, blammo orgasm. And I think there's a distinct periorgasmic period um, that actually has a decrease in sympathetic nervous system tone and an increase um, in the alpha component of the brain response uh, from what we measure, which is electroencephalography, uh, which is consistent with like a letting go uh, kind of experience. So in other words, the sexual response might be get excited to a sufficient level, whatever that is, and that's a big question mark. And then you have to make a shift to this periorgasmic period that involves actually some decrease in sympathetic tone. Uh, in some ability to let go or release that would allow then the orgasmic experience to happen. And so as you may know, we still don't know really what triggers the orgasm. We know a fair amount about like what happens right up to it and then what happens in that during that reflex, like once it's initiated, but that little magic point, whatever that is, um, that actually causes it to flip is a bit of a mystery. And so that's an area that we're really focused on in my laboratory. And I hope, you know, in say five years, I'll have a paper out that talks about what we think that periorgasmic period is, which could mean a revision uh, to that really well-known model. So I would love to see if that's the truth. That would make sense. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, because some people have those blockage, like they need permission to release, to have the orgasm. Like they're holding well, is, onto yeah. it. So clinically, like we see this distinguished pretty well, that is some 
Um, this is more common in women, although it certainly also occurs in men where uh, women tend to have problems with one or the other. They either say like, I have trouble getting going. You know, I don't have spontaneous desire, but once I'm going, you know, I have an orgasm, everything's fine. And then there are other women who say like, I get going just fine. And then I just like hang, you know, I just can't get over the bump. And I don't know why, like I sit there and I'm like, turn the vibrator up and I do it more. And I really love my partner. Everything's good there. And I just can't experience it. And I don't know why. And so I think it's, it could be because these are very separable stages, you know, that that could explain this cl clinical phenomenon we often see um, where people tend to struggle with kind of one phase or the other. Um, certainly some struggle with both, but there's also some clear distinction. And my suspicion is that might be why. Really interesting. I mean, I, again, I know we're talking more from experience, but um, we've actually done Tantra for quite a while. And separ okay. separating out, again, I would love to have a study on this, but separating I out. I know, I know, <laughs> I've heard so much. Tantra, I'm telling you, I will study you. I'm very interested. It's just a funding issue. Sorry, go ahead. Of course. Oh, no, no, we'll just put it out there to the universe. It's like, get the funding, get the funding. <laughs> Yeah, we can have a, a, a I don't know, Bill Gates needs to donate some money to something. Good. Oh, Jeff Bezos, he's just let go of Amazon, so why not? <laughs> God, if I was a billionaire, the weird stuff that I would fund. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> but one of the things we learn is to separate, uh, at least for a penis owner, the ejaculation from the orgasm. That mm -hmm. you can have an orgasm. And, and really the big difference is, of course, ejaculation semen it's a, it's a lower body reaction uh orgasm is what happens up in your mind and i'm not saying in your thoughts there are chemical releases that occur with it which which can be i can't quote it but proven by science that you get those chemicals you can feel good uh, about it. you get the results after it but if you could separate those two mm -hmm. it, it just it just really seems like then there's a hell of a lot more that we think this is how things work that are absolutely false and yeah. And that's part of what I'm interested in the health applications of sex is, you know, which of those really require climax or related to climax, which has this really specific um, characterizations that are distinct from sexual arousal or high sexual arousal states. So, for example, like if we think that um, the brain shares some features with mindfulness meditation during high sexual arousal states, you may be able to get health benefits just from being highly sexually aroused and not needing to have a climax. Wouldn't that be nice to know? <laughs> you know, if you uh, have trouble kind of keeping your mind in a mindfulness meditation practice because you get distracted and all this other stuff's going on and you're like, do I really want to do this? Uh, you might be a lot better at practicing your meditation, <clears throat> which I heard was a difficulty for someone in this call. Uh, <laughs> if, if it were uh, done in the context of high sexual arousal, you know, so something where it's prescribed, you can either do mindfulness meditation or there's a brain state that seems to be induced that's similar during high sexual arousal states. That'd be pretty cool. But my suspicion is like for the sleep application, it's probably not enough to be sexually aroused. My guess is you need climax, um, possibly because of the prolactin uh, shift that happens at that time, uh, that that seems to be a somnolent that might be contributing to why people feel sleepy specifically after climax, not just sexual arousal. So absolutely, like the ability to separate those gives us power to also look at health applications of the different components of the sexual response. I'm loving this. <laughs> Although you're the one who wouldn't benefit. Because no, I don't. I get, I get an the, adrenaline high after oh, I climax. Well, <laughs> so I have a theory about this. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Tell, well, tell us the theory. I got, <laughs> so I said, you know, like after sex, uh, it seems to be sandwich or sleep, you know, like people either want to get up and eat and like do other stuff or they're ready to conk out. Um, and I'm like, how does this happen? Because it's the same reflex. Like if it happens, you should, one thing should be prominent. Uh, and maybe it is, maybe we're not asking the right questions, but uh, the other possibility is when you're getting really sexually aroused, ghrelin is suppressed, which is kind of a hunger hormone. And so one possibility is like, if you've ever had sex long enough that like you, you forgot to have lunch, you know, <laughs> like it was so good, you're just kind of still going. And as soon as the climax happens, you're like, oh my God, I'm starving. That's probably why is all of a sudden ghrelin comes back online after the sexual arousal is reduced and you're like, holy crap, I need food. And so I wonder if there may be something related to motivational state that's more broad than just food per se, that like when that ghrelin returns, 
um, that it could be for some people when they have climax that, okay, you know, did I have that suppressed uh, to where now that that feedback or that bounce back is somehow related to this motivational state that sends me jumping out of bed and wanting to run around doing stuff and other people fall asleep. Uh, so I have no idea. I'm just speculating wildly, but that's part of the fun. But yeah, I'm so annoying. interested right now oh, because we, we no, okay, we experienced the hunger afterwards so much. We've coined the term PSM, post-sex munchie. <laughs> and we will go out on dates. We actually have a date night mm -hmm. where we will order a bunch of food and intentionally not eat most of it, take it home so we can have sex and then throw it right in the microwave and have a great meal right afterwards. That's awesome. And do you find, sorry, this may be too personal. Do you find the food tastes different? No, we never paid attention to that. I wouldn't say it tastes different. I'd say I get more pleasure out of it. That's true. Okay. That's what I'm curious about. So I'm also interested in exactly that issue, like post-orgasm, how does that change, whether it's pleasure perception or even like basic sensory perception around taste issues that I've never seen studied. I'm super curious about that. Ooh. You see, and the other one that my mind went to was actually having a diet based around edging. Basically, mm. masturbation to the point because because I've I've realized with the stuff we do in BDSM, um, mm -hmm. when I am in a heightened state of arousal for long periods of time, which may happen, but there's no orgasm, mm -hmm. I will go hours and I'm really not hungry. The science is totally behind you on that because of the ghrelin suppression. That's a whole nother issue on Weight Watchers we could have. <laughs> What if, wouldn't that be crazy? This probably wouldn't work, but wouldn't it be crazy if it did? <laughs> if like the best way to lose weight suddenly becomes sexual arousal. Like the people just, you know. <laughs> TM, TM. <laughs> uh, <that's> right. <laughs> hey, we have a scientist to back us up. Why not? <laughs> We could fund. Uh, I mean, I <laughs> now I got to win that Powerball. I'm funding this research. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, there's a reason to think that something like that could work. <laughs> hmm. And 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 again, okay. My my background. I have a degree in computer science, and then I got a business degree, and now I teach. Uh, I teach. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I have. I still have a very analytical mind which now brings me to the reverse side of it of oh, when God. I see really skinny people, I'm like, what are you doing in private now? <laughs> that I don't know. Yeah. I haven't seen any like absolute weight. Hmm. I don't know any data that speak to that. No, but I got you thinking. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Another project for her to get funded. <laughs> totally. So Nicole, thank you for being on the show. How can anyone find you or find the research that you're doing? Uh, the easiest way to find me is libroscenter.com. So that's L-I-B-E-R-O-S center, all one word, .com. And I also have a research gate profile, which if you're a scientist, that's where we go dump all our papers. So you can find my peer reviewed research and read all the crazy stuff we're working on, including that paper that just uh, is coming out in PLOS One. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you coming out. We, we have learned so much, so much tonight, and have so many. I expect ideas. wank watchers next year. For sure. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. Very Thanks for the ideas. <laughs> Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Well, if you like this content and you want to find more of us. Um, where can they find us? I'm I'm laughing still. So I, 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 I'm, I'm like trying to catch my breath because it, this was just awesome. There, everything sex positive me except for Instagram. We had to change it due to their terms of service. So it's SPM the Lunas. So that's where you could find us and all our antics going on. And don't forget date night with the Lunas uh, every other Tuesday. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, uh, Nicole, for spending the night with us, and we will talk with you soon. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Hey, John. Hey, sweetie. What's up? Uh, I need
need to run to the store and get some new toys. You broke your toy again, didn't you? I was not admitting to that right now, but yes. Well, let's go down to Fair Villa. They have a very well-trained staff that can help us select a new toy and even help you out with those Bluetooth Wi-Fi issues you sometimes have. Oh, well, that's all your department. You're the techie. I just enjoy the pleasure. I know, I love the mega store just because they always have the class list right as soon as you come in. You're talking about Fairville University, which has classes every month on subjects ranging from BDSM to non-monogamy to just plain toy safety. Yeah. Fairvilla, for pleasure, fun, and fantasy. Mm -hmm.